Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Richard Griscom. Richard specializes in the documentation of endangered languages and functional typological linguistic description with emphasis on the languages of East Africa and the development of digital field web methods. He's currently focusing on the documentation of Hadza, a language isolate of Northern Tanzania. Please join me in welcoming Richard as he gives his talk, Push to Town, Community-Based Research with the Hadza and Ihanzu. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction. And first, I would like to share some URLs in the chat for anyone who is watching the webinar live. There's quite a few URLs there. I will paste them again at the end of the talk in case anyone missed this. Uh, and I will be referring to those URLs throughout the talk. So as linguists, we are well aware that each language and each speech community has unique properties. And the same can be said for endangered language communities. Some endangered language communities have their own cultural centers, language committees, and active revitalization programs. Others have an official status recognized by the government of the country in which they reside and may even receive government support for revitalization. Many endangered language communities, however, have no cultural center, no language committee, no revitalization programs, and no shared financial resources. The community may reside in an area where local laws actually prohibit common revitalization projects, such as indigenous language radio programs or schools. As linguists continue to promote collaboration with speech communities in the language documentation process, it's also possible to observe some commonalities and differences in the collaborative methods employed by different projects. Who exactly are we collaborating with and how? What is the impact of our collaborations both on the output of the documentation process and the community itself? Some proposed models for collaborative language documentation such as the Chickasaw model seen here are rooted in the experiences of language documentation practitioners working with organized and independently funded endangered language communities. Many types of activities and outputs assumed by the model, such as the prior existence of community-based revitalization efforts and the production of text materials based on documentation cannot easily be applied to all community contexts and language documentation projects. What I would like to do today is to share my experiences and those of my colleague, Andrew Harvey, as we sought to establish two new community-based language documentation initiatives with the Hadza and Ihanzu communities of Northern Tanzania. From these experiences, I will propose an alternative model for language documentation that does not rely on the existence of language revitalization activities as a source for community feedback. First, I'd like to review our initial plans prior to starting the project, just so you can uh, get an understanding of how everything was organized. Andrew and I were awarded two postdoctoral fellowships from the Endangered Languages Documentation Program to start two documentation projects focused on the Hadza and the Hanzu languages, and also to build on the documentation of the Gorwa language that Andrew had already started. In our joint proposal, we laid out the following organizational structure. Martin Maus of Leiden University would serve as our supervisor, and we would facilitate the establishment of an advisory committee for each community that we were working with if there was not one already. The committee would then advise us and our colleagues on how to proceed with our documentation efforts at various stages of the project. We would train eight members of the Hadza community and two members of the Hanzi community to conduct their own language documentation. The community members filling this role are called local researchers, or LRs for short. The local researchers would be organized into teams of two, uh, each of which would share a video camera and an audio recorder. And then each individual local researcher would have their own computer for backing up data and creating transcriptions and translations using ALON. Andrew and I, as well as the local researchers and the advisory committee would work with members of the community to create documentary materials and to request feedback on our progress. 
would also work with one or more people preparing data and metadata for archiving, or called data assistance. Uh, finally, we also plan to involve other outside researchers in the project, including linguists and anthropologists. So here you can see some of the researchers that we had in mind uh, prior to starting the project. So some of these researchers may be familiar to you. Uh, now I'll tell you how it actually went in practice. So in, in the late fall of 2019, Andrew and I reached the Lake Ayasi Basin in northern Tanzania where Ihanzu and Hadza are spoken. It was then that the, the two projects really began. And I'll now go into detail about the day-to-day -day activities of the projects in order to provide a clear picture of the social and geographical context in which these languages are spoken and why these contexts are so different from the endangered language community contexts of Europe and North America. I also hope to indicate to some degree the amount of effort that is required to conduct a collaborative language documentation project in such contexts. Our first task was simply making contact with all of the communities that we plan to work with. Over the next two months, we visited all of these locations that you see on the screen. You can access an interactive version of this map using the URL that you see on the screen, which I also pasted into the chat. It was clear to us that at an early stage that it wouldn't be possible to reach all of these locations by using public transportation and purchasing a car was too expensive for our budget. Andrew had previous experience driving a motorcycle in Tanzania, so he suggested that we both use motorcycles for our primary mode of transportation. Here you can see a shot of Andrew with his motorcycle in the Mbulu Highlands. To get an idea of what the driving conditions are like in Tanzania, you can watch the video at the URL that you see on the screen. Uh, keep in mind though that the footage in the video was shot only during good weather and that actually we did experience a lot of bad weather and rainfall in particular has a significant impact on the surface conditions of the, the paths and also the depth of rivers that need to be crossed. We were greatly assisted by Andrew's friend Juma who both helped us to purchase new motorcycles and taught me how to drive a motorcycle. You could see Juma here helping Andrew to attach a strip of rubber to the back of his motorcycle in Babati. Many of the locations we were traveling to had no accommodations, no running water, and no electricity, so we had to take additional equipment with us, including tents, sleeping pads, water filters, small amounts of food, and extra clothing. Actually finding, actually finding each location was a, a challenge in the beginning. Uh, there are no detailed maps of this area. Uh, there are no maps showing where the roads and smaller paths are. And we also had no GPS coordinates. Instead, we often relied on the assistance of local residents and giving us directions. Here you can see Andrew taking a GPS point reading at uh, Endegulda on our way to Domanga. Upon arriving at a new community, our first task was to introduce ourselves and our work and then register with the local authorities, find a place to set up our tents, spend some time socializing and sharing meals, and begin the search for potential local researchers. In between visits to some of the more remote locations, we would stop at guest houses along the way. Uh, this was a time to rest, dry off any of our gear that had become wet in the rain and replenish our supplies. These are all of the local researcher stations that we established during the initial stages of the project. Using Haidam as our starting point, we first traveled to Domhanga based on advice from Dowdy Peterson. On the way, we quickly encountered some very challenging conditions as we navigated through an extended section of deep sand and were then stopped by knee deep mud uh, these four young gentlemen from Eshkesh helped us by carrying our motorbikes over the mud so that we could continue our journey. After arriving in Domanga, we quickly heard that there was another nearby community by the name of Kipamba, and that uh, the Hadza speakers there were also interested in participating in our language documentation efforts. We hadn't planned to establish a research station there, so we decided to reconnect with that community at a later time. 
Over the next three days, we meet our way to the westernmost Hadza community called Sungu. It's located to the north of Wekayasi and is far removed from all of the other Hadza speaker communities. Along the way, we got stuck in the mud many times. We also had to cross many overflowing rivers, such as the one you see here. Uh, we were happy to learn, though, that a bridge had been built recently over the Sibiti River, which allowed us to more easily travel north to Sungu. In Sungu, we found that the social context in which the Hadza reside was indeed distinct from that of the other Hadza communities to the east. Many had integrated into Sukuma families, and their speech showed greater influence from Sukuma. Andrew and I were very excited to create the first open access recordings of Hadza speakers in that area, and I personally was looking forward to further exploring language variation across the Western and Eastern Hadza communities. After spending a few days in Sungu, though, we had to continue our journey to the other communities. As we traveled south, we discovered that just south of the CBD River, the road continued to the village of Ibaga. We didn't create a GPS path for this portion of the route, uh, but it's indicated in the map by the uh, blue arrows. The village of Ibaga is where we ultimately decided to set up our local home base or office, and it is there where the two Ihanzu local researchers reside. We also learned that there were additional routes from Ibaga to Kipamba and Manga and even to Haidam in the south. Our next stop was Mangola on the opposite side of Hadza land. To reach Mangola from Ibaga, you must either drive directly through the bush or go all the way around it. We opted for driving around it. So we passed through Haidam again and continued through Mbulu and Karatu in the Northeast and then came back West to Mangola. In Mangola, we met with some old friends of ours, including Mariamo Anyawire and Guru Bala and then we started the process of obtaining local research clearance. Andrew and I were very happy to hear that Mariamo was interested in serving as a local researcher, but we're also a little bit disappointed that the, uh, the new very high local fees for conducting research with the Hadza meant that we personally would not be able to work with the speakers in the Mangola camps. Our final stop was at Mongolomono, just north of the road from Haidam to Mbulu, and on the other side of the Yaida Valley from Domanga. Here we met with Ndeko, a seasoned Hadza research assistant. He invited us to his home and a nearby camp, and he agreed to work with us as a local researcher and helped us to find a second researcher within a short period of time. After making contact with all of the Hadza and Ihanzu communities and identifying the individuals who would be serving as local researchers, we hosted a language documentation workshop in Haida. One unique aspect of the workshop was that members of the Gorwa community who had experience in language documentation through a previous project with Andrew provided much of the instruction. Andrew and I wrote a report on this workshop, which you can find at the link that you see on the screen. We invited all of the local researchers from each community to Haida. As Andrew went to the bus station to receive them, however, he was surprised to find two extra people. They were two members of the Kipamba community who had been chosen and sent by the community to serve as local researchers in our project. We'd only budgeted for 10 local researchers, not 12, but we had some extra equipment that they could use, so we decided to include them in the training and following documentation activities. In total, we had around 20 participants, including Martin Maus from Leiden University, Michael Korani from University of Dar es Salaam, and Agustino Caguema from Nkwawa University College of Education. During the workshop, the Gorwa instructors and Andrew and I trained participants on the fundamentals of language documentation, including data and metadata collection, Data, manage data management, transcription and translation, and backup. We also produced three short videos in Iraq, Ihanzu, and Hadza to serve as a means of introducing speakers to the idea of language documentation, how consent is obtained, 
how participants are paid, and how documentary materials are archived. You can watch these videos at the URLs that you see on the screen. After the workshop, all of the local researchers returned home. The final step in enabling them to conduct documentation independently was to install solar panel systems at each local researcher station. Each solar system includes a solar panel, a battery, and a controller. These are what allow the local researchers to use laptops in areas with no electricity and also to easily charge their other equipment. During our visits to each local researcher station, we also provided feedback on the initial recordings that they had produced. You can watch a short compilation of shots from videos produced by the Hadza local researchers at the URL you see on the screen. We were successful in a number of ways during the first year of this project. The plan to expand on the Gorwa local researcher model to cover different geographical areas was largely successful. And to this day, we're able to communicate remotely with each local researcher station via WhatsApp. We also successfully implemented a mobile metadata system using the Open Data Kit platform which allows us to view the metadata created by each local researcher on a cloud server. We used an elicitation method that my colleague Manuel Otero and I developed to quickly create timeline transcriptions and translations. And we also created a unique set of mobile recordings of spontaneous speech during traditional foraging activities. You can learn more about each of these at the URLs that you see on the screen. We have also been successful in collaborating with other researchers, although perhaps not the same set of researchers that we initially imagined. Uh, Didier de Molan and Alain Guillo offered to work with us and a few Hadza speakers to create some unique articulatory measurements of Hadza speech sounds. During this period of intensive recording, a Hadza man from Domanga agreed to transport speakers to, uh, from Domanga and Mongeza uh, using his motorcycle which had a painted mud flap with the phrase that inspired the name of this talk, Bush to Town. As you heard about two weeks ago, this collaboration with Didier and Alain later inspired further collaborations with Bonnie Sands, Kirk Miller, and Jeremy Coburn, which are still ongoing. Not everything worked out exactly as planned, however. Both local researchers from Sungu, for example, were not able to continue with the project. And this was a significant disappointment for us because we really wanted to focus on that area. We also experienced some turnover in the local researcher teams of Kipamba and Mongoamono. What you see here is a representation of the changes in current status of each station. Mangola, Domanga, and Ibaga have not experienced any turnover and are fully staffed, so they are represented by full circles. Sungu is an empty circle because there currently are no local researchers there. And Mongola Mono is a semicircle because we currently have one local researcher working there. We've also experienced some challenges with the equipment, most notably the microphone stands and the laptops. All of the microphone stands have broken, and three local researcher stations have had complications with their laptops. Here you can see a functioning microphone stand in a video produced by the Mangola local researcher team. And here you can see an easy solution to the problem of a broken microphone stand, simply to hold the microphone in your hands. We installed Linux on the local researcher laptop so that we would not have to worry about viruses, which are a common problem in East Africa. If any of the local researchers accidentally filled up the hard drive of their computer, however, it would refuse to turn on and would display a screen like this one. We would then have to walk the local researcher through the process of removing the files, which sometimes involves using the command line, as you see here. 
Another challenge we encountered was that we simply had very little time because of the amount of support we needed to provide to the local researchers. In fact, at the end of my time in Tanzania, I had to make a choice between producing the GoPro videos that I referred to earlier and visiting Mongo Amono to train a new local researcher. I chose to make the GoPro videos, but now we have had only one local researcher at Mongo Amono for almost half a year. We also had very little time to conduct a licitation and a linguistic analysis. As you can imagine, we didn't see the COVID-19 pandemic coming and certainly did not plan for it. Uh, luckily, however, because we'd set up remote communications with the local researcher stations, the pandemic hasn't had a very significant impact on the project until recently. As time goes on, however, there is increasing risk of data loss at each local researcher station because we did not put in place a method for audiovisual data to be backed up remotely. We are still missing data from Sungu, and the equipment that we provided to Kipamba doesn't allow them to create recordings of a quality that we would like. Our current plan moving forward is that Andrew will return to Tanzania and I will stay in the Netherlands at least until the summer of 2021 or the situation changes earlier. Uh, Andrew has been coordinating with Dowdy Peterson and others in Tanzania to create a plan for how he can return to the Lake Adassi area while also minimizing the danger to his health and that of the speech communities. Andrew will be focusing on data backup, uh, providing additional feedback and support for local researchers, uh, equipping and training Kipamba uh, on how to use the new equipment and uh, collecting new data. I will be staying in the Netherlands and focusing on archiving the data that we've already collected, uh, new data that we will be uh, receiving after Andrew returns to Tanzania, uh, adding legacy materials from uh, previous researchers of Hadza, uh, creating reports on the metadata and text data produced by the local researchers for Andrew to use when giving feedback to the local researchers and then also conducting linguistic analysis, especially of natural speech recordings. Another challenge that we encountered, at least on the Hadza side, was the advisory committee. The Hadza community already had established a cultural group that could function as the advisory committee for the Hadza language. But um, as we started to learn more about how hard it was to travel around Hadza land, we realized that a single Hadza advisory committee wasn't really feasible. It also wasn't clear if it was a good idea to establish a language committee because that could be seen as a political move of sorts. And looking to the literature on language documentation for other ideas, we still have yet to find something that looks like a, a good fit for the Hadza community context. Uh, one example of a proposed model for language documentation is the Chickasaw model, as I mentioned earlier in this talk. This model puts an emphasis on the incorporation of revitalization into the documentation process. And this model is probably a very good fit for many community contexts but it wasn't immediately clear how it applied to the Hadza community context. Uh, here are some specific ways in which the model uh, was challenging to apply to a context like that of the Hadza community. Uh, for example, there were, and, and to this day still are, very few or no community-based revitalization efforts taking place in the community. Uh, most common revitalization outputs aren't feasible in this community context, so uh, it is possible to produce printed materials, of course, um, but as anyone who's familiar with East African communities knows, uh, printed materials are not very popular in rural communities, and they are very easily damaged. Um, access to an online resource such as a dictionary or archive is very limited and uh, language schools are generally prohibited in Tanzania 
Uh, revitalization is generally not funded by language documentation grants. So in our case, ELDP is generally flexible and does like to support community-based initiatives. Uh, but some funding organizations such as NSF explicitly state that they do not fund revitalization. So uh, it's not possible to assume that a language documentation project will be conducted with a community that also has a funded revitalization project. Uh, also, there simply isn't sufficient time within the scope of a short two to three year grant for linguistic analysis to significantly inform documentation. So again, this is part of the, the Chickasaw model that uh, the analysis of documentary materials can then be used to inform the creation of new materials. So say for example, if you analyze some of the materials that have been created and you notice that there are certain constructions that occur at a low frequency and uh, you'd like to get more of those constructions, then you can try to identify certain speech genres that might feature that construction at a higher frequency. Uh, also, as I said, uh, creating an authoritative group like an advisory committee or language committee when there wasn't one already can potentially have negative social consequences. So you can't assume that there is some sort of uh, authoritative voice to provide, uh, provide guidance on how documentation should proceed. At its core though, the Chickasaw model reflects the idea of feedback and iterative design. And this is something that both Andrew and I have identified as valuable and relevant to our work in these community contexts. So what I'd like to share with you now is a feedback model for language documentation based on the Hadza and Ihanza community context, which isn't reliant on re revitalization efforts for community feedback. The first step is guidance and then also training, which is conducted by the language documentation practitioners. So in this case, uh, Andrew and myself, and then also the, uh, the Gorwa instructors doing the training workshop. This is provided to the new local researchers. The second step is the actual creation of documentation materials by local researchers, and then also the language documentation practitioners. The third step then is the distribution or provision of these documentary materials to members of the community. And the final step is then the uh, guidance provided by members of the community to those creating documentary materials. So at the end, this results in a feedback loop whereby local researchers and language documentation practitioners continue making new documentary materials and receiving feedback on those materials. This is after an initial stage of guidance and, and training. It should be pointed out though that in order for this feedback loop to continue, financial support might be required for certain steps. So for example, during the documentation stage, uh, all of our local researchers are paid because they're taking the time and effort to do the documentation. And if they weren't doing that documentation, they would probably be spending their time doing something else, which is contributing to their livelihood. Uh, the same might go for distribution or provision, depending on the method that is employed. And if you are uh, establishing a uh, an advisory committee, then you might also want to uh, contribute to the members of the advisory committee uh, for the, the, the time that they are using to provide that guidance. And even following this model, there are still some challenges, especially when it comes to distribution and community guidance. Uh, so as I said, uh, the Hadza community in particular has little to no access to the online archive where documentary materials are ultimately deposited. Also, the audio and video, uh, they're recorded separately, but then they should be later merged for use by the community. So what I mean by that is uh, when we create a video, 
or using a video camera and an audio recorder. And those create essentially two recordings. It is possible to merge them together during the recording process or to do it later. Uh, our method is to record them separately. So that means that they then have to be merged together uh, at a later time in order for the video to be accompanied by audio that is of sufficient quality and at a sufficient volume. Also, the data formats for community use are different than those for archiving. Uh, so our, our primary goal in creating recordings for archiving is that they be of the highest quality possible. But for use by the community, especially in, in the Hadza context, uh, a lower quality is actually ideal because many Hadza speakers do not have access to computers, but rather have access to small phones, which have the ability to play back video at a low resolution. So that means that then all of the recordings need to be formatted into that low resolution format. And that, again, is an additional processing task. And that's one that in our current setup can only be completed by Andrew or me. So that means that, uh, that local researchers cannot distribute these recordings on their own. They have to rely on us to uh, complete this processing task before they can then distribute them. In terms of uh, the ideas that we've been discussing for distributing recordings, uh, one of the ideas uh, that we'd like to implement in the near future is the distribution of recordings via micro SD cards. This is something that I've done in the past with the SMJ Toka community, and it was uh, quite successful. Uh, again, uh, this is a, a very accessible format for speakers living in remote areas because micro SD cards can be used by uh, feature phones, that is phones that are not smartphones, but they do have a micro SD card slot and they do have the functionality to support playing low resolution uh, video recordings and also MP3 audio recordings. We've also discussed the idea of doing a, a, a film tour. So to go to each community and then um, show perhaps a dozen or so uh, videos that have been created by local researchers. And we would travel around with a projector and either a screen or a large white sheet and invite members of the community to gather together and, and watch those films together and then um, encourage them to provide feedback on the recordings that we showed. Uh, additionally, uh, guidance can come from anyone in the community. It doesn't necessarily need to come from a specialized group, such as uh, an advisory committee. Uh, so there are a couple of ideas here that we've discussed. One is that we just encourage all members of the community who have uh, receive copies of the recordings to then provide feedback to the local researchers and to ourselves. Uh, another idea is to establish smaller local advisory committees. So for example, Mangola could have its own advisory committee and Manga could have its own advisory committee. Uh, this could be effective, but is uh, definitely more time intensive. Um, could be more problematic. Uh, we could experience additional turnover. So it would, it would just take more time and effort uh, to set that up. Uh, but those are, are two of the options that we've uh, explored so far in terms of getting community guidance. I'm also curious if any of you have additional ideas. So I'm interested to hear those during the question and answer period. So in conclusion, I think we could say that collaborative community-based language documentation is possible. I say basically anywhere because uh, before we started this project, um, many people were, were quite uh, suspicious uh, as to whether or not we'd actually be able to do this. They, they didn't believe that it would be possible to train members of uh, a hunter-gatherer community like the Hadza to conduct their own language documentation. And I think in this case, we have proven them to be wrong. However, 
that isn't to say that it's easy to do. It's very challenging and very time consuming. And if you plan to take on a project like this, uh, you should not expect to have a lot of spare time to do linguistics research. So this speaks to a changing role of the linguist, especially in terms of language documentation. I would say that most of our time was spent facilitating the project rather than doing actual linguistics. Uh, so we're, we're becoming more like uh, team managers than researchers. Also, the type of collaboration can vary from one community to the next. So as we saw with the Chickasaw model and the Hadza Ihanzu model, we might see that um, different types of activities are taking place in the community. There are different types of social organization within different communities and the relationships between language documentation practitioners and community members can also vary um, depending on, on the community and uh, the, the types of organizational structures that you try to build into the project. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, for your presentation. I think we can now begin the question and answer section. So the question and answer section will be open to both voice questions uh, and written questions. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send the request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question, that's also still possible, so you can do so uh, using the chat module, and I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded, so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. And I will start with my own question to give other participants some time to write or to look for the raise hands button. Um, where to start? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for this really interesting presentation and such a detailed look into this kind of project. Um, I'm also wondering about your research station and what kind of um, life expectancy they have, because your project and your funding ends in 2021, right? Yes, that's correct. And that is a, a very good question. And that's, um, that's a, an issue that all language documentation projects face, um, but especially those that attempt to increase the, the level of community engagement and involvement. Uh, so in terms of our particular project, um, we're planning to, to seek additional funding to lengthen the, the amount of time that data is collected. It can't go on forever um, unless the Hadza somehow develop their own internal funding. Uh, they will always be reliant on external funding to, to pay for that documentation to be done. So in our case, we will most likely be looking at the Firebird Foundation. Um, uh, both Andrew and I have, uh, have received fellowships from the Firebird Foundation in the past, and uh, it was those fellowships that actually inspired the collaborative approach that we're taking now. So we'd really like to continue that with the Firebird Foundation if possible, uh, and then we're looking at other funding sources, of, of course, uh, you know, anything that, uh, that we can find that will allow us to continue this work. Thank you, very interesting, yeah. Um, I think I see a raised hand from Bonnie Sant, so I'll ask her to unmute. Hi, congratulations. This is a lot of hard work. I know how hard, <laughs> I know how hard this was. Uh, I wonder if you could say something for people that might be thinking of writing a similar kind of grant proposal, like, do you think you would have been successful in getting funding if you had not already worked in the area and for somebody who might want to work in a similar type of uh, hesitate to even use the word community because the lack of a, a well-defined community is part of what makes this a problem and getting funding a problem so and if you were work doing this work for your phd and not getting linguistic analysis done that that's also problematic so i'm wondering if you could make some more general comments about how strict do you think the funding agencies are and how willing they are to uh, accept these different kind of challenging uh, fieldwork situations yeah thanks that's a great question and i didn't really speak to that during this talk but yes andrew and i 
I think we were uniquely prepared to conduct a project like this. So if neither of us had ever been to Tanzania before, then no, I don't think our project would have been funded. Even if perhaps we'd been to a different region of Tanzania, we might not have been funded. But uh, both Andrew and I had worked in that specific area. And for me in particular, I had experience doing research in Mangola and in Matawa on the other side of Hadza land. So I had already traveled through that region. Um, oh, and then also in the Yaida Valley in a community called um, uh, Gidibuger. So um, I, had, I, I had some uh, personal experience just navigating that region on the ground. Um, and Andrew and I both had experience doing this sort of collaborative research with communities in Tanzania. So it was sort of a very specific context, I think, for us as researchers that allowed us to do this successfully. Uh, also on the technological side, uh, some of these things we had experimented with before, so it wasn't all totally brand new. Uh, when you asked about a PhD student trying to take on a project like this, uh, that's a very good question, and this is a continuing issue with language documentation, especially at, at the doctoral level. I myself took on a documentation project during my PhD, and it was very challenging. I was not as prepared as I was for this project, and I did not really have much time to do linguistics research. And perhaps as a result of that, I didn't have as many publications by the end of my program as I had wanted. Uh, having said that, however, I, I do hope to see a change in this regard in the future. So increasingly, there has been a push to recognize the outputs of language documentation as valuable outputs. Uh, so for example, um, we see increasingly uh, that uh, journal articles uh, describing the contents and the organization of archives uh, are acceptable as uh, valuable publications, just like a research article might be. Uh, but also the documentation materials themselves can be cited as a contribution. Uh, there's a, a, a lag though, in terms of the expectations of hiring committees, uh, perhaps committees for getting tenure. Uh, so oftentimes uh, these committees are looking at journal articles and are not at all interested in archives or corpora. So in that regard, we, we still have a lot of room for improvement. And it is a risk for a student or a junior scholar to take on a project like this because they won't be able to compete as easily with their peers in terms of producing publications and conducting research. So that, that is a concern and that, that is something that needs to be addressed in the future. Marta Tynes in, uh, into this question in the chat says, uh, and you needed each other, neither of you would have managed on their own. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. <laughs> There's no way that one of us could have done this. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I can't imagine it. Well, so Andrew's project was actually funded before mine. And I think uh, ELDP was very happy to see my proposal because they saw that this increased the likelihood that they would have a, a successful uh, Hadza project, uh, just because they knew that the, the, the context of the Hadza community is it's challenging. Um, and to have two people on board, it makes all the difference. Uh, just to have someone there to, to give feedback, to give support uh, in the field. Say if one of us is feeling sick, then the other can take on a heavier load. Uh, we also have um, different areas of interest and expertise. Uh, so we, we complement each, each other very well. Um, so yeah, I think it definitely would not have been possible if one of us went alone. And then I see a raised hand by Jeremy Coburn. Jeff unmuted. Uh, thank you, Richard, for this uh, awesome presentation. And obviously, for all the work you do, you know how valuable it is to me uh, personally, but also to the community. 
Um, one question that I did have is um, you mentioned, you know, some of the challenges in doing this project and in, in continuing it, especially now where you are not in the country, Andrew's not in the country and getting back to the country is, has challenges and, and obstacles that have to be overcome. So I'm curious to what extent you have found interest or have sought interest from researchers inside Tanzania. So local, not local as in from the communities you're working with, but local as in Tanzanian inter internal, perhaps from University of Dar es Salaam or elsewhere. And whether you think that it would be beneficial to try to involve uh, more Tanzanian um, collaborators in this work and what what ask, what benefit that may present for your project going forward great thanks yeah that's a wonderful question and uh, the short answer is that uh, yes we should do that and uh, we had planned to do that but um, that's one area in which we have fallen short and, and we can improve uh, so you saw in an earlier slide, I think I had uh, Amani Gusekelo there as one of the researchers that we wanted to work with. And uh, we haven't really engaged Amani. We could be better about that. Um, we, we are, uh, well, I personally am communicating with uh, Amani about um, the Toga research, for example, but we haven't perhaps discussed the, the Haza research uh, in, in as much detail. Uh, so this could bring a lot of benefits to our project and to the Tanzanian academic community. Um, it, it, I think it, it could uh, help our project in the sense of um, integrating our research together with these regional or national initiatives or local in the kind of larger sense. Um, and that we could then pull our resources together. We could get uh, more researchers involved who are interested in uh, pursuing uh, language documentation, interested in pursuing the description of the Hadza or Ihanzu languages. Uh, there are not that many researchers um, that I'm aware of in Tanzania who are working on Ihanzu or Hadza. So it would be great to support uh, uh, local researchers, um, for example, at University of Dar es Salaam or University of Dodoma in coming out to the Lake Yassi Basin and uh, working with those communities. I think establishing those connections uh, could be very beneficial for all involved. And yes, I do look forward to uh, doing a better job of that in the future. Then I'll move on to some questions in the chat module. So the first one is from Alice Mitchell. She says, thank you, Richard. You've both achieved an incredible amount in that short time. And it was really great to hear about the project so far. I'd like to hear more if possible about the types of data the local researchers are collecting. Presumably they were given some guidance on what type of data to, uh, would be valuable, but also encouraged to pursue their own interests. Uh, have there been any novelties slash surprises in the types of language use they've been recording? And also, if I can ask a second question, what kinds of attitude towards the project have you encountered among community members? Do people immediately see the value in language documentation or were there more critical perspectives? Thanks. Yeah, those are very nice questions. In terms of the local researcher data, um, well, I think I could say that the guidance that we gave them during the training workshop was that they should attempt as much as possible to pursue their own interests. So they should identify some aspect of their community or their culture that they're interested in, that they think is uh, valuable and of significance to the community and something that they want to share. Uh, so in that way, we've seen a range of different things. Um, a number of local researchers have been uh, collecting recordings of songs and of dances, um, but also uh, discussions of various traditional cultural activities. Um, perhaps because we encourage them to use uh, camera stands and microphone stands, they, at least in the, the audiovisual data that we have so far, which is increasingly a, a small percentage of the data they've collected, uh, 
most of the recordings were not mobile, they're stationary. So that restricts them to certain kinds of recordings. And I imagine we might encourage them in the future as they become more familiar with the equipment to create more mobile recordings. Um, despite this, though, there, there were some recordings of um, honey gathering, for example. Uh, so in this case, uh, the, the camera operator held the camera in their hands and then followed a uh, Hadza speaker as they climbed up a baobab tree and then uh, retrieved some honey from the tree, came back down the tree, and then sat down with another speaker and ate some of the honey together and, and chatted a bit. Uh, so we see some variation there in terms of uh, stationary recordings versus mobile recordings. In terms of the actual content of the recordings, um, we still have to, to really dive into that data. So we're just now starting with our Flex database. We have it set up so that we can work collaboratively. So uh, both Andrew and I can work on the same database uh, remotely. So we're hoping to get started on some of that natural speech data. And in terms of the attitudes to the project, uh, and Andrew is, is welcome to uh, jump in here uh, if you'd like to add anything. Um, the Hanzo community was definitely very receptive and I think just generally understood what our intentions and goals were with the project. And uh, they, they jumped on board right away. Uh, with the Hadza community, um, there's a larger number of foreign researchers who interact and work with the Hadza. And um, there, my, my impression is that there's um, maybe not more suspicion, but there's, uh, they, they don't believe so readily that the, the work that we're engaging in is going to come back and benefit the community in some way. So that is a notion that we had to actively counter. And that's one reason why I'm excited about distributing the micro SD cards when Andrew returns to Tanzania, because that will be essentially the, the first stage of closing that feedback loop and demonstrating not to the local researchers, but to just general members of the community that the work we're engaging in is actually going to result in some sort of change or some sort of added value for the community. Um, so that's something though that we have to, to work on and to work towards. It's not something that you get for free. Hi, um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just jump in. Richard invited me. Um, um, so I, have, uh, I just have a word on Alice's uh, question about what kinds of data uh, we're seeing. And uh, I would say that, you know, it's, uh, we have had some surprises along the way, uh, specifically with regards to the kinds of things that uh, the local researchers have been recorded, uh, recording. So we know, for example, that um, the Hadza people have been studied for a relatively long period of time. There's been sort of at least 100 years of, of engagement with researchers uh, studying and describing the Hadza, and we know that from that sort of um, from that sort of um, collection of materials, that the Hadza are often described as a very sort of you know conservative society uh, that eats certain things, that interacts in certain ways, that um, that don't have much uh, um, contact with the outside world. And I think what's been exciting is that because we've essentially let um, our Hadza local researchers record what they want to record and, and tell the stories that they want to tell about their own communities. We're seeing material that is somewhat very different from, from these uh, existing uh, accounts of the Hadza people and, you know, and ways that the Hadza are, um, are characterized even up to present day articles. So instead of a picture of a, uh, of sort of a, a static um, a group that a conservative group that you know are, are very involved in hunting and gathering we get that stuff so Richard talked about the honey uh, hunting and we have foraging videos but we also have some other very surprising sort of recordings of people talking about um, modern day uh, issues things like uh, uh, things like um, you know uh, life stories uh, moving uh, to different uh, communities 
We have somebody who uh, who shared a recording about uh, issues regarding uh, regarding uh, substance abuse and alcohol. Uh, we also have uh, some good recordings uh, of older people talking about uh, rainmakers in their uh, communities. So this was something that was uh, that was sort of very surprising. Uh, given uh, what we've read in previous accounts about the Hadza, who um, would are not an agricultural people and would supposedly not really need a, a, in their society a rainmaker, but we have at least two different uh, geographical areas of Hadza people talking about uh, rainmakers. So uh, that's always very surprising. I think that the bottom line in terms of what we've seen is that because we've given our local researchers sort of a large remit in terms of what they want to record, we're, we're seeing sort of new narratives and we're seeing sort of new things, uh, new things coming up, new stories. Uh, but yes, also sort of different genres that we didn't really expect. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, so then I'll return to the chat. I have four different questions by Michael Colani. Um, he starts out with saying, great work, Richard and Andrew. Uh, would you please clarify the negative impact from the advisory committee or community-wide collaborators, as you mentioned? Um, question number two, do we need to have guidance twice in the Hatsa Ihanzu model? I thought one in the circle uh, would do to make a proper cyclic model. His first question is, do you think is it practical to engage a local collaborator who has a studio in the area or nearby town for production of DVDs for community distribution? And his last question is, having faced the challenges you mentioned, do you think you need more time to complete your projects? Thanks for these questions, Michael. Uh, starting with the first one, uh, the negative impact from the advisory committee, um, this, yeah, it really depends on the community context. So in the case of the Hadza, um, it's, it's a very uh, ethically fraught context. So, um, there are a lot of stakeholders in the, the Hadza community, uh, a lot of external stakeholders and a lot of uh, internal members of the community who position themselves uh, with, um, with regard to these uh, kind of external influences like tourism and, and research. And establishing a, a group of people who essentially represent a community-wide authority uh, could be seen as an attempt to funnel community resources towards certain individuals, for example, uh, or funnel resources towards a certain community. So even uh, among the, the various Hadza communities, there's sometimes a sense that, um, that people value their local community over some other far away Hadza community. So for example, if you're a member of the Kipamba community, you might want to see more activity and more resources flowing in your community in Kipamba rather than Mangola. So uh, setting up an advisory committee that represents members of, for example, just one community would definitely be problematic but also setting up an advisory committee that consists of members that are related to each other or somehow connected to each other could be seen as a disproportionate uh, uh, um, acquisition of, of uh, documentation funds. Uh, in terms of guidance uh, twice in the Hadze Hanzu model, the, the reason that there was an initial stage of uh, guidance and training that is sort of external to the feedback loop is because that's the, the step that is required to, to create the feedback loop. Uh, so it, it doesn't need to happen again. It's this initial capacity building that's done during the training. So this is done um, by someone who has some sort of specialized knowledge related to language documentation. So in this case, the Gorwa instructors, uh, or uh, Andrew, or me, or one of the other participants at the training workshop. And then after that, it is no longer necessary for us to impart that knowledge because it only needs to be imparted once. Once the local researchers have that knowledge and they know how to use the equipment, they know how to create recordings, then they can essentially do that on their own. So the guidance that they receive after that is sort of different in nature. So that's why I differentiated those two different types of guidance. 
Uh, in terms of engaging a local collaborator who has a studio in the area for producing DVDs, uh, that is definitely applicable for some communities. Uh, in terms of the Hadza, I don't think there are very many Hadza households that have televisions, um, especially those with a, a, a DVD player. So I'm thinking in Mangola, I can think of one, but I don't know of any in Domanga. I don't know, oh, there might be one in Mongola Mono, but there, there certainly aren't very many. Uh, but that could be a possibility for creating sort of a, a community level resource that, that, that's shared by everyone. So they come together to watch the recordings on that TV. That is actually, that's a good idea. And, and I, I think we will uh, discuss that. Uh, in terms of uh, needing more time to complete our projects, uh, well, yes and no. Um, this is related to the earlier question about um, uh, obtaining additional funding. Uh, I, I do think that the project would benefit from uh, having more time to collect data uh, and having more funding uh, to continue the data collection as the local researchers become more and more experienced. Uh, in terms of this particular project, uh, we'll have to wait and see how the next year goes. Um, if we see that the data collection is going well, and then Perhaps these two years are sufficient. There is a possibility that EODP will be offering extensions to projects for uh, the last grant cycle, so our, our grant cycle. Um, but it's not clear yet if we're going to need that. All right, I'm going to stay in the chat module. I'm going to go on to a comment from Marta. He says it is true that you're at a disadvantage using all your time and documentation at this stage for getting jobs and next grants. But with this massive corpus that you know best and the language that you are familiar with, you're at a huge advantage in the rest of your academic life, enabling you to publish on a wide range of topics. It's just a bottleneck. Um, get some help from the powerful medicine men. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, thank you. No, that, that's true. Um, I, I mean, I, as I said, I, it's generally recognized that uh, language documentation archives or corpora are valuable it's uh, just about um, using that data and producing those uh, publication outputs. Uh, and that just takes a little bit more time. Um, so yes, if we are successful in, in curating a, a very nice archive, uh, then that could be a boost for us later on in our careers. Um, then I'll move on to a question from Bonnie Sands in the chat. Uh, how can the study of multilingual practices be accommodated by the Chickasaw model? Hmm, that's a good question. And hmm, my initial impression is that it, it probably isn't easily accommodated by the model. It, it seems to be closely aligned with this uh, one community, one language model, uh, which is also oftentimes employed in, in Europe. Um, I guess it would depend on who is uh, providing the guidance and the, the values that they hold regarding multilingual practices. So if, for example, a community primarily spoke one language, but also spoke another language, which is also used by another community, if they s valued the use of that second language um, and wanted to promote the creation of recordings that include use of that language, then I, yeah, I think there would be no problem. But um, hmm, I don't know, I, I would be surprised to, to see that in practice. Um, I, I think in reality, the, a model like the Chickasaw model and perhaps even the Hadzi Hanzu model are very abstracted. And uh, in practice, it's always going to work a little bit differently for each community. So you, you can't expect a generalized model like that to cover absolutely everything. But what I attempted to do is create a generalized model that at least more closely resembled what we were seeing with the Hadza and Hanzu. All right, then I'll move on to Jeremy Coburn, who has another voice question. Yes, um, 
I just, I'm curious for maybe those who are listening and, and, and you've talked about a bit about the challenges of not just what you have faced for this particular project, but kind of the challenges of the larger project of documenting and or revitalizing and or, you know, uh, assisting the community to uh, continue in this uh, trajectory of, of documenting their own language and in keeping it um, with some vitality. I'm curious if you could speak to um, maybe what, what do you guys need you to specifically moving forward from you know, other people um, beyond just, uh, you know, obviously funds, which is always helpful. Um, but like for those who may be interested in collaborating or assisting in this um, project, not specifically your project, but the project of documenting or uh, revitalizing the language, what work do you feel needs to be done to be able to assist in that? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. I think probably the biggest thing is uh, in increasing the depth and the breadth of our, our network. So we've started this project and it currently involves a, you know, a certain number of people but we would like to diversify the number of people who are involved in this project and who are aware of it. Uh, so this goes back to your question about um, uh, Tanzanian researchers. So connecting with uh, researchers in Tanzania, I think would help to raise awareness that this project is going on and it can be and something similar could be done with other communities in Tanzania. I think also connecting with some of those other stakeholders that I referred to. So uh, connecting with um, non-governmental organizations, connecting with uh, land rights organizations like the Dorobo Fund, and um, not only just sharing uh, news of our project, but trying to see if they want to get actively involved in any way. Uh, not just in supporting us financially, but in, um, in, in driving this, this feedback loop, which is based on community awareness of the language documentation project and sort of a, a, shared, um, a shared value of the output of that documentation project. So I think promoting those documentary materials and promoting the connections between those who are making them, those who are uh, observing or consuming them. Um, I, I think that would, uh, I think that would greatly benefit the project. And I think that has the potential to increase the longevity of the project as it becomes uh, more self-sustainable rather than requiring us to provide this uh, external support uh, for however long we can. Thank you. And I have a final question from Andrew Harvey, which I think ties into these topics. He says, you and I have discussed this a lot, Richard, but I'm interested in what you see uh, uh, the long, no, sorry, uh, but I'm interested in what you see the long tail of a HATSA project looking like. For example, it's uh, three to four years on from the present. We have several hundreds hours worth of audiovisual recordings in Hatsa, perhaps not all translated and transcribed. Uh, what would the work of local Hatsa researchers or other associates of the project look like? As you mentioned, we can't go on doing data collection indefinitely. Um, how would our roles as language documentarians slash linguists look? And how would this be different from the Chickasaw model? Let's see if I can unpack this. Well, in terms of what I would see three to four years from now. Let's say that audiovisual data collection has stopped. Uh, what would the next step be? Well, we would have amassed a, a, a large amount of recordings. So you said several hundred hours worth of audiovisual recordings. So the next step then is the transcription bottleneck, as it's commonly referred to. And to fund or to, to solve that problem, um, it's a combination of continual funding uh, for local researchers uh, or any member of the community to transcribe and translate recordings. And then also accompanied with that, um, developing some, um, some sort of tool like a parsing lexicon and flex, for example, uh, to 
then more quickly uh, process those transcriptions and then produce the, uh, uh, the, the linguistic annotations uh, that we ultimately want to be in the archive. Uh, you can also uh, develop um, uh, automatic speech recognition. So if, if you started uh, developing a system for forced alignment, which we are starting with Hadza, once you have enough training data, you can then create a speech recognition system, which can either serve as a tool to produce uh, an output that then is edited by um, a, a member of the community uh, to make it faster to create a transcription. Or if it's accurate enough, then you can just use that as the transcription to then input into your parsing lexicon. So the, the further out we go, I, I see some technological solutions that could help with that transcription bottleneck. But in the medium term, uh, there definitely still needs to be some continued funding for manual transcription and translation by speakers. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, data collection cannot go on indefinitely. Uh, well, it can go on indefinitely, but uh, then we increasingly create um, more or an even larger transcription bottleneck. Um, I guess in theory, if you had an automatic speech recognition system that was extremely accurate, then it, it wouldn't matter if you're continuing to collect data because then it could be automatically transcribed. Uh, but given the realities of the funding situation, we have to allocate some of our funds to that, that transcription portion of the process. And so that means that at some point we need to shift from data collection to transcription and translation in order to make that jump. Uh, in terms of our roles, um, it's still the role of the facilitator or the, the team manager. So the, the local researchers, they are, are still able to transcribe and translate just like they were before. And we are simply um, guiding them in that transcription and translation process. So uh, providing them with uh, recordings that uh, need to be transcribed and translated, and then uh, taking their transcriptions and translations and then incorporating them together with the other data. In terms of the Chickasaw model, it's only different in that the uh, revitalization component is not there. Uh, certainly, the revitalization could be introduced. So if there was funding for revitalization, then that could be started. Uh, but again, as I said, there are, are issues related to common uh, revitalization uh, activities in the Hadza community context. So it's not so clear what a Hadza revitalization project would even look like. But say if there was one, then certainly it could be incorporated into the workflow. And then something like the Chickasaw model would be more applicable. As it is currently, however, um, that component, that revitalization component simply isn't there. So there's nothing to incorporate into the language documentation process. All right, thank you, Richard. I think that brings us to the end of the question and answer section. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentation in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. And with that, I would like to thank Richard again for his presentation and of course everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.